Sabine Hassenfelder rightly attacks non-falsifiable bullshit, but one week earlier she praises non-falsifiable bullshit. Welcome to Real Physics. Today I will talk about dark matter, but if you talk about it, think twice. This is my message and again I'm inspired by a video by Sabine Hossenfelder. She does a great job, even if she contradicts a little bit herself, I think. But let's unpack that. Unbelievable. It's that the Webb telescope found evidence that clearly contradicts predictions. Yeah, that's very interesting and the James Webb telescope is a fantastic instrument, but now what concretely happened? In the early universe there should be only small galaxies. Then they collide and merge and grow to increasingly larger ones. That's correct, that's the current paradigm, but... Until recently that was plausible because we just didn't have any data for older galaxies. Yeah, that's not exactly news because here is a paper appeared some 15 years ago that says exactly that. And that's why I recently talked to the author and we discussed his research about the early universe and how galaxies should look differently and how that contradicts the standard model and so on and so forth. Feel free to have a look at this. We are finding that uh, there are galaxies which are too massive. Uh, they are uh, galaxies almost like the Milky Way in size or in, not in size, in mass at least. Uh, when the universe was very young, was uh, 600, 700 mega years. Yeah, this is in contradiction for a long time with what Hossenfelder describes as the model building of contemporary cosmology. This is indeed exactly what they calculate with these computer simulations for structure formation, like the one you see here. They show the gradual buildup of galaxies, mostly from the mergers of, here like it that. comes, dark matter halos. Yeah, these models look very scientific, but once you realize that all this is at the very end theoretical fantasy, you don't appreciate it that much any longer. And now let's see what a real expert on galactic dynamics, Robert Sanders, says in his excellent book, The Dark Matter Problem. He calls these models an industry of galaxy formation modeling, poorly understood effects such as gas cooling, star formation and supernovae hydrodynamics are modeled by a number of adjustable parameters. Supernova feedback time scale for star formation, I count as many as eight such free parameters. When their observations are matched, the model is called successful. Yeah, indeed, this computer modeling is merely kind of playing around with arbitrary assumptions. As another well-known critic, uh, Mike Disney, has noted, they start off with a whole lot of cold dark matter dots. The dots apparently form filaments under the influence of gravity, and we are supposed to admire the result. What result? That to me is the question. In my opinion, it is nothing more than a seductive but futile computer game. I was impressed by the insights of this eminent astronomer Mike Disney, and that's why I conducted an interview some eight years ago. Feel free to watch it. Regarding dark matter in general, Disney has a quite harsh opinion about it. He says, conventional gravity outside the solar system, it simply never works. So if you're told that dark matter has problems, that's not exactly a surprise, even if there are very new and very new results showing exactly that, well, dark matter has problems even with the newest and best telescope. Now what astronomers do is to fiddle around with numbers, trying to reconcile the model with their data. This is also criticized by Sabine Hassenfelder. Listen. When that fails, they'll try to fumble with the dark matter models to make them fit the unwilling data, which they have already begun. Yeah, it's sad because people are not skeptical enough anymore. Listen to Mike Disney. People are actually working uh, in galaxies um, are much more skeptical about CDM, you know, which is a standard model of galaxy formation. Dark matter, yeah. But we're in a dreadful position because it's almost become a religion now. Okay. Yeah, he calls it a religion. Yeah, there's a lot to say about how scientific opinions are formed and that's, by the way, the reason why I interviewed Lopez Corridera because we both have published books about groupthink and sociology in science and how that heavily influences what we believe to be is objective truth observed by telescopes or in the laboratory. Now, Hossenfelder rightly continues saying that 
there is evidence against the dark matter model, but she somehow champions the alternative modified Newtonian dynamics and sees it as the winner in this debate. And I kind of disagree here because, well, if dark matter is falsified, it doesn't mean that the alternative is verified. And why you have some data which are nicely fitted by the alternative theory, if you want to call it like this, at the very end, it's not a theory because it's just a formula. You haven't the faintest idea how it is justified and what could be the possible fundamental implications. I agree with the big accomplishment that we have to consider small accelerations, but as a theory, it's still in its embryonic phase. So rather than closing the race and declaring one candidate to a winner, which is not developed at all, we just should realize that probably we haven't found the correct theory of gravity at all, and we still need to think about it. And, and of course, everyone has different ideas about I like variable speed of light. And recently, a guy has pointed out a possible relation of variable speed of light and the small acceleration regime. Read the paper by Manuel Urena. But this is a sideline. I don't want to claim either that I have a theory. Now, what stunned me is that Sabine Hassenfelder very nicely pointed out the deficiencies of modern academia, the invention of free parameters, the fiddling around with models, all that non-scientific stuff. She really did a great job exposing that. But at the other hand, she put out a video in which she's patently naive about these kind of dark matter ideas. Look at this one. In the past decade, astrophysicists have dramatically so, shifted their opinion about so dark what? matter. The most popular idea is still that it's made of particles, but it's now a different particle called the axion that's attracting most of the attention. They yeah, I mean, what does that mean? There are papers or scientists are talking about. I mean, every bullshit is growing in an exponential way. So that's not an argument to begin with. And calling this a new idea is also kind of preposterous. Why? Well, because I mocked it some 10 years ago. It's just one of these many apps or proposals of particle physicists, call it Fotinos or Winos or whatever. You can search forever, but you will never find any of them. And that's by the way that why again the very sound critic Robert Sanders says the real problem is here that dark matter is not falsifiable. The ingenuity and imagination of theoretical physicists can always accommodate any astronomical non-detection by inventing new possible dark matter candidates. This is the problem. Now listen to that recent proposal. New type of axion. It was originally called the harmless axion or invisible axion because it was designed to be compatible with observations. Savor that. An invisible stuff designed to be compatible with observation. That means it's invisible by definition. And okay, of course you take it for evidence if it's invisible. That's patent nonsense, as we see here. But unfortunately, that's how modern physics works. People develop some fantasy and say, okay, it's not visible, we don't see this and that, and the very fact that they don't see anything, they take it as positive evidence for their fantasies. Yeah, that's a well-known absurdity in the philosophy of science called Hempel's paradox, but maybe Sabine Hossenfelder could not know about. Or could she, since she had made a video about it? Maybe she forgot about it because she called it the Raven paradox and Funny sideline, Hostenfelder advertises a quiz. If you've already forgotten half of what I said, this video comes with a quiz that'll help you remember what we talked about. Yeah, maybe she should do a quiz about her own videos once in a while, but let's come back to the absurdities of that proposal. But for those with small masses like axions, the missing energy is below measurement accuracy. Why on earth are you calling these axions? The peeling candidates for dark matter. This is because the quantum uncertainty of a particle depends on its wavelength. And the smaller the mass of the particle, the larger the wavelength. We have to stop here for a second. Physics is quantitative. And we're talking here about Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, which links the spatial uncertainty or possible wavelength of a particle to its mass or energy uncertainty. But if you plug in the numbers of a galaxy here, you get something like 8.5 10 to the minus 63 kilograms, which is more than a factor 10 to the 30, smaller than the electron mass, the lightest known particle, which is 10 to the 30 
lighter than everyday objects. In a nutshell, this means that this is complete and utter bullshit. So what surprises me here is that Sabine Hassenfelder rightly attacks non-falsifiable bullshit, but one week earlier she praises non-falsifiable bullshit. I don't understand this. But I think what we need to understand here is how science works, how scientific opinions are formed, how established theories in science are formed, and you need to dive a little bit into philosophy of science. There are great minds like Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. Popper who developed the notion of falsifiability and Thomas Kuhn wrote a fantastic book about paradigm shifts and scientific revolutions and I summarized the two messages in one could say that Popper laid down the laws of how good science should work and Kuhn described how these laws are bypassed in practice. Yeah and if you go still deeper I think you have to consider the history of scientific culture, of scientific thought, and in this respect, not only because Popper and Kuhn, but it's important to consider the development of physics in the 20th century under the dominating power, which was America in the second half, but Europe in the first half of the 19th century. And it's worthwhile to dig into that because we must ask ourselves why we have distanced ourselves so far from the good successful science of the beginning of the 20th century as exemplified by Einstein. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to like it and if you are interested in fundamental physics subscribe to this channel.